Hello, everybody. Welcome to Kicking Back and welcome to another episode of Good Call. So uh, you might remember the last one we did. We had Shaka Hislop join us. Very insightful and fun. And you might remember like a week or two ago, we were talking about this new film called Copper 71, which was about an underground World Cup in Mexico. Uh, so today we're joined by the researcher for the film and uh, a founder of a CIC called Our Goal, uh, Ella Williams. Hello, Ella. How are you? Hi, I'm good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, doing great, thank you. So I think the the big question really to get things kicked off is how did you actually first find out about this underground World Cup? Yes, so I first found out about um, the Mexico tournament back in, nine. Um, I was about to say 1971, which is so not true because <laughs> I wasn't born then. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I found out about the tournament um in 2019 I was actually at, at university um they were doing there was like a guest lecture from three of the players which was Leah Caleb Jill Sale and Chris Lockwood and they were invited in to talk about this tournament that they'd taken part in um and which transpired to be this unbelievable record setting world cup out in Mexico um so yeah it was thanks to one of my Hispanic studies lecturers actually that I first met the players and really found out about this tournament who actually won the World Cup and like what actually happened and what happened to England? Because you, nobody knows you want, who won the World Cup. Yeah. Do you want me to tell you the spoiler? I can tell you who won it if you want to know. Do we want that, Lewis? I don't know. Now I'm thinking it's tense. <laughs> I'm literally going to watch the film. I'll tell you what. <laughs> what was the final? Uh, Mexico, Denmark was the final. Oh, oh okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So host country against Denmark. Um, but it's interesting, isn't it? Like nobody knows who won this World Cup. So yeah. On that, note, I had no idea that that even happened. No, this is what I mean. Yeah. Like, so, so for something that's so massive to have almost been like hidden from history, it's really fascinating. I was going to ask, like, could you talk about uh, the process of actually researching it and what you actually learned about and how you even learned it? This is quite a crazy story, really. Yeah, it is. And like, it's, you know, like you called it an underground one. People have still, you know, now the films come out, more people know about this tournament, um, but people are still only just finding out about it. And it was absolutely huge at the time, it set the record for the highest attended women's sporting event in history. And um, I suppose researching it was challenging because so little was known about it. Um, there was no Wikipedia page. You couldn't really Google it. There was bits and bobs written in sort of academic journals about this tournament that happened, but nothing much. Um, so yeah, most of the research that, so my, my role was kind of split into a few different things, working with the players. So a lot of time, like going to meet the women that took part in this tournament, um, sitting in the living room, having a cup of tea, hearing what actually happened. Um, and we did that in, um, well, the countries that took part were England, France, Italy, Denmark, Mexico, and Argentina. So um, it was an amazing job. I like, went to all these places and met all of these amazing women, heard about their stories. So that was kind of part of it was their sort of lived history and experience. And then the other part of it was the archive. So a lot of my job was reading through the Mexican newspapers from the time, <clears throat> because this was so massively covered. There was so much coverage of this tournament. There's loads written about it in Mexican papers from 71. So um, a lot of actually like reading through articles to find like the match report and see who scored, who scored when, um, and find out. We kind of like designed a calendar of everything that went on that month of August out at the World Cup. Um, so yeah, it was it was a, um, a challenge, but a really, really fun one. Something to get your teeth. Sounds it. great. Yeah, it does. It sounds awesome. Um, what I was going to ask, this has just occurred to me really hearing you talk. So firstly, I've just put it two and two together about Hispanic studies. That makes sense now. And uh, the other thing I was going to say was, uh, who actually organised this World Cup? Because uh, you, you, we'd, we'd just take it for granted, really, who organises World Cups and things like that. But this particular one, um, I, I'm not too sure what, what actually occurred. Yeah, so this World Cup was not organised by FIFA. It was organised by an alternative organisation that were known as FIFA. F-I-E-F-F -F. Oh. Um, and they were the tournament was financed by Martini Rossi the drinks company um, they basically like with a group of Mexican businessmen put a load of money into this tournament because after obviously in, well in 1970 Mexico held the Men's World, World Cup and so all of the infrastructure was there for this tournament they'd seen the commercial success of Mexico 70 and so they wanted to repeat that. Um, and that's what they did with 71. And it was basically businessmen that put the money into this venture. Um, and it was organized by a committee called FIFA, which is why, partly why, 
when FIFA came to England and they wanted a uh, an England team to go out and represent the the country in the World Cup, what was at the time the Women's Football Association said no because they didn't recognise FIFA as an official footballing body. Um, and at the time as well, in seven, 1971, women's fo- women were not allowed to play football, basically. Like, they were not allowed to play in affiliated stadiums. And... Sorry, is that in England? Um, <laughs> yes, right. that, is, that is in... Um, that was in England. So, women's right. football was banned from 1921... Pippa, away. 1921 yeah. to 1971. And um, because of that, the Women's Football Association... There was no national team, so they couldn't send out an England team to the tournament, um, which is where a man called Harry Back came in and he sort of travelled up and down the country, pulled the team together and took them out to the tournament. Wow. I was going to ask, why do you think nobody knows about it? Why does nobody know this World Cup happened? I think, like, the, the reason for that is because even the women that took part in this tournament didn't talk about it. So, like... When we started, when I first met them about five years ago, there was women on the team that had not told the children that they took part in this World Cup. And that's wow. because they, yeah, crazy. Like, and, and you know, since then, over the last five years, their friends have started to find out, their colleagues at work have found out. And um, that's because when they got back from the tournament, they were really shamed for having gone out there because they weren't allowed to play football at the time. And so rather than celebrating this massive achievement when they got back they were banned from their local football clubs um they were pushed out of community football um and really made to feel like they'd done something wrong and punished for that so if even their family didn't know of course we didn't know about it it was really hmm. hidden imagine finding out you've won a world cup yeah, yeah no <laughs> well not i'm not gonna spoil it but they didn't win England. Okay. Yeah. I thought it was in the final in my head already. Yeah. I was going to say, (laughs) when you're actually talking to these people and hearing their stories, then um, was that the most surprising thing that you heard about how this was almost suppressed information? I mean, that's really shocking to me, to be honest. Or was there other surprises that you heard along the way? Yeah. I think that was the, I guess that's the big thing about this story is that it has been, it is largely undiscovered up until now, um, like 50 years it's taken for people to find out about this story. And so that is probably, I don't know if I'd say the most surprising thing, but definitely like the thing that makes you emotionally like involved with this film and this project, because these women have gone through so many years, not being able to talk about, not even not being able to talk about, but feeling like they can't talk about such an amazing thing. Um, And so when you watch the film, you know, it's a celebration of women in football and everything that they've achieved, but also it leaves you feeling like you need to, do something and finally these women have got a space to talk about their experiences uh, if people wanted to find out more about the film where can they go can i ask that um yes yeah, so the screening window in cinemas will be probably coming to an end now but as part of the impact campaign of the film hopefully there's going to be some more local screenings over the next few months and hopefully soon it will be more sort of publicly available as well um dog wolf are the company that are distributing it so the dog wolf website has information about screenings and things like that I actually don't know there's a Wikipedia page yet about copper. Um, so, yeah, there'll be more on Google now. It is, People be are in the link. To... I'll link yeah. it in this video. Um, yeah. But, oh, we're going to do a film review on this channel as well. We're going to do that next week. Nice, so, uh, nice. We'll, we'll try and keep the buzz going as well. Um, did this, because uh, I mentioned when I set this up that uh, you have a CIC called Argo. Um, mm-hmm. Did that follow uh, your involvement with this film or did it come before? Where, do, where does that fall in the timeline? It did. I uh, we finished the so the production of the film was twelve months, so that finished in June of twenty three, okay. and then in July, about four days later, because I just get itchy feet, you know. Um, I set up our goal, which is a not for profit organisation whose purpose is to empower every girl to be active and to reach her full potential. So through community football and also through mentoring with the teenage girls that are most disengaged with sport. So trying to help them, um, like break down the barriers that they face to being physically active. <clears throat> So that's based in Manchester at the minute. And it was off the back of the film that I set that up because um, really Copper shows the, basically the impact that football has had on the lives of these women, because you can see that all of them are strong women, they're resilient, they're powerful. And I believe that's something that every girl should have access to. And that's what our goal is all about. Um, So actually three of the players I mentioned before, the one Chris Lockwood, Jill Sale and Leah Caleb are also work with me like they're ambassadors for our goal as is the film director Rachel so it's very closely linked and it's part of the legacy like the ongoing legacy of the film 
It's like it has a very real impact then, doesn't it? Like straight away. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, before before it's even rolled out the film, just in that very thing alone, uh, it's got a real yeah. act. So, do you have a do you have a plan for the actual uh, CSE in terms of where it goes or what happens, or is it just about day to day really what you can do on a daily basis? So at the minute it's just Manchester based, but yeah, like my plan is that I want this. To, I'm turning. I'm trying to make it into like a replicable model that will be, especially the mentoring program that I do with teenage girls, because there's like a 42 percent dropout of teenage girls from sport, which is an enormous amount of girls that are dropping out of sport and physical activity. Um, so I'm trying to, what I'm doing, I want it to be replicable all across the country, basically. Amazing. I think it's great, you know, I think especially with the teenage girl thing, I think that's so important. Like I could see it in my teenage years, like I really relate to that as well. So I mm -hmm. think, you know, what you're doing is is great. Like it's really inspiring. Thanks. I should ask the same as well. How could people find out more about that if they wanted to go and check that out? You can go on my website, rgold.co.uk, um, and everything's on there that I do. There's actually, you know what, this is very relevant. There's a fundraiser, Hebden Bridge Film Festival hosted like an, an Argol opening night for the film. And they're running a fundraiser at the minute for Argol. Um, they're auctioning a signed post film poster, copper poster. So it's signed by three of the women that took part in the tournament, Chris, Jill and Leah, and two other former lionesses, Kerry Davis and Issy Pollard. Um it's ten pound to enter, but all the money goes to our goal. So if anyone wants to do that, I can send you the link and you can share it. Amazing! Yeah, I'll pop it in description awesome. as well. That's absolutely amazing. So this has been fascinating, and I'm sure people are going to want to check this film out. We're going to check the film out now. Come back with a review. So thank you so much for having a chat with us. I really do appreciate. Oh, it. you're so welcome. You're so yeah. welcome. It was so Locked quick. So I much know, to yeah. say. <laughs> on. No, it's just informative, isn't it? It's quite fascinating, and I'm yeah. I'm trying to be careful about not peeling away too much of the film of what's actually in it as well. You know what I mean? Because, yeah. Well, I don't want to spoil it for myself. I'm being selfish. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, honestly, thank you so much once again. Really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we'll pop all them links in the description. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, take care. Thank you.